Good morning, Judge. The state would like to continue questioning Ms. Littman. Uh, you may, Ms. Littman. Let me remind you, you remain under oath from yesterday. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. So when we broke for the day yesterday, we had been talking about the processing of 118 West Road conducted by you and other investigators pursuant to the investigation, right? Yes. And the room that we had stopped off at yesterday was the upstairs bathroom? Yes. So I want to continue on uh, going to the bedroom next to the bathroom. So this is a photograph that we saw yesterday, and it's looking into the bathroom. As one goes to the right from this bathroom, what room is to the right? Um, the master bedroom. And is that the bedroom where Maureen R.G.'s body was found? It is. So the next slide, I'm showing you one of the photographs from State Exhibit 69. Is this the bedroom ne uh, uh, next to the bathroom uh, and the bedroom in which Ms. R.G.'s body was found? Yes, it is. And was this photo taken after her body had been removed from the bedroom? Yes. And with respect to where her body was found, it was in this bed that we're seeing here? Yes. But again, for this photograph, her body has been removed? Correct. Now, the next photograph is an enlargement of the photo that we just saw, and it's focusing on the carpeted area for the entryway of that bedroom. Uh, yesterday, you had talked about some apparent blood staining in front of the bathroom leading into the, the bedroom. Yes. Do we see some more of this apparent blood staining in this photograph? You do. Down here. Here. The photo that we just viewed before this one, again, Ms. Argy's body had been removed from the bedroom. Were photographs also taken where her body was found, including when you accompanied the assistant deputy medical examiner? to view her body initially? Yes, they were. Are some of those photos taken states exhibit 70 through 77, which are in front of you? Yes. So let's go through those photographs. Okay. I'm going to start first with states exhibit 70. Where is Ms. Argy's body in this photograph? Her body is right here. And does this photograph also document some apparent blood stains on the bed? Yes, it does. And where are there some apparent blood stains on the bed? You can see dark right here, but blood stains here and then over over here. And when you indicated blood stains here, did you mean on the headboard or on the pillowcase? On the pillowcase itself, on the corner. So the next slide is States Exhibit 71. Uh, her body is not visible in this photograph, right? Correct. Uh, was bedding moved to cover her body? or was bedding in the same position as when her body was found in the bedroom? That's the same position as her body was found in the bedroom. And her body is actually under the bedding here? Yes, it is. And although we could see her body in the other photograph, it's just a different perspective, and that's why we can't see it here? Correct. Do we also see some apparent blood staining on the bed? Yes, you can, and over you on this side over here. Next slide is States Exhibit 72. Where is Ms. Argy's body in this photograph? Her body is right here. And again, do we see more of that apparent blood stain? Yes, all on the other side of the bed. Sure, yeah, I was going to suggest that earlier. Uh, Attorney Hinckley, uh, Unless you think it's going to interfere with your presentation. It will not. Thank you. Okay. Did Thank you. you. That's much back? clearer. I think you should. I, it, it, um, Absolutely. Yeah. So 
let's believe we're on State's Exhibit 70. Yes. And where again uh, is Ms. Argy's body in this photograph? Right here. And you pointed out the apparent blood staining, if you could do that again. Right here. And then and you can. here, uh, going back to here, this again is on the pillowcase, not on the head. Correct, right on the pillowcase corner. And then you can now see with better lighting, so there's some blood stains over here. And the next photograph is States Exhibit 71. This is the one where we can't see your body. Your body is still on the bed, though. Right? Correct. Uh, and you pointed out some apparent blood staining. Where is that again? On the other side, over here. And then you can see the corner of the pillowcase a little better here. And where we left off, this is States Exhibit 72. Uh, again, where is her body? Her body is right on the right side of the bed here. Her body, is it in the same position that it was in in the last two photographs that we saw? Yes. So her body has not been moved from this photograph from the previous two photographs? No, it has not. So here we have uh, the bedding that is covering the body. And the next photograph, States Exhibit 73, has that bedding been removed? Yes, it has. And how generally was Ms. Argy dressed when she was found? She was dressed in a nightshirt, night pants, um, pajamas, and um, socks. And we can't see the socks in this photograph. They're covered off by the bedding. But if you can describe those socks for the jurors in terms of color. Sure, the socks were white with um, blue and red stripes. And we've gone over uh, the apparent blood stains on the bed we see on the corner of the pillow in here. Were there any apparent blood stains on Ms. Argy's white socks? No, there were not. Now, in this photo, in Ms. Argy's exposed skin area here, we have discoloration, a purplish pink discoloration. Yes. Based on your experience, what does such discoloration indicate? Sure, so that purple um, pink discoloration is from lividity or liver mortis, and that's when um, the body, the blood stops circulating, the uh, red blood cells pool at the lowest point based on gravity where the body is. So basically this is uh, blood that has fallen due to gravity at the lowest Correct. point? Yes. Our next photograph is States Exhibit 74. What portion of Ms. Argy's body do we see here? Um, we see her back, um, her neck, and her, the back of her head, as well as her ear. Now, in the previous photograph, we saw some discoloration to her waist area. Do we see such similar discoloration in her body in this photo? Um, you can see it a little bit on, in her neck, kind of uh, the front her and ear, her ear, ear. Right yes. Uh, but we don't see any at the back or neck right here. Not in the back, nope. So the next slide is going to be States Exhibit 75. First of all, at the top we have uh, this blue colored object. What is that blue colored object up there? That's a nitrile glove. So that's from somebody turning Ms. Argy's body over? Yes. Either yourself or another investigator or the ADM. Correct. Assistant Deputy Medical Examiner. Yes. And do we see some more discoloration to Ms. Argy's body in this photograph? Yes, you can see the lividity in the, in the front of her neck and the front of her face. We also see some at her, at her fingers. Correct. Now we also see some blood here. We see some blood on Ms. Argy's face and also a pool of blood. Is this where her face was located on the mattress? Yes, it was. Now again, based on your experience, what did this blood on her face and the pooling under her face appear to be? That's purge. And if you can explain for the sure. jurors what purge is. Um, based on the location of the body um, and when a person is deceased, the, um, there are decompositional fluids, bloody fluids that um, seep out of the body through the orifices, usually the mouth and the nose. So this isn't indicative of trauma, it's indicative of the natural body uh, decomposition process? Yes. So the next slide is States Exhibit 76. First again, we see uh, someone in this photo with Ms. Argy. Is this another, either the ADME or an investigator? Yes, I know that's the ADME based on her shirt. And does this appear to show the discoloration again to Ms. Argy's face? Yes. 
And we also see some discoloration to her stomach as well. Yes. And if you can explain for the jurors, we see a, a, what appears to be a patterning on her stomach of the discoloration and also what appears to be the natural color of her skin. If you can explain that for the jurors. Sure, that's from the sheet, the, the bedding that she's laying on top of and it's folded. Um, so some of the body is quite touching the um, bedding and um, it causes that discoloration, uh, the non-discoloration. The next slide that we're going to turn to is States Exhibit 77. What is depicted in this photo? That is the uh, right side of Maureen's neck and face. And again, we have blue here, and that's either probably medical, assistant deputy medical. Yes. Uh, in addition to discoloration, do we see darker discoloration to Ms. Arnie's neck in this photograph? Yes, right here. Now, were photographs also taken of the bedroom where Ms. Argy's body was found after her body was removed as part of the processing of the crime scene? Yes. And States Exhibit 69 shows some of the many photographs that were taken afterwards? Yes. And as for the photograph on the upper left, this is the photograph we saw before we saw all the photos of Ms. Argy? Correct. I think that's the next slide which we've just discussed. And again, Ms. Argy's body has been removed from this particular photo. And yes. And ones that follow. We go to the next photograph. Now, with respect to apparent blood stains, we have seen them on the bed before. We also see them on the floor by the bed. Yes, on the carpet. And turning to the last of the vertical photographs in the States Exhibit 69, Before, uh, we saw the picture of Ms. Argy's face with the apparent blood purge on her face and mm -hmm. also on the mattress beneath her face. Do we see that apparent blood purge on this photo as Yes, well? it's right here. Sorry for my shaky hand. And on the right side, there is that uh, gold-colored pillow that indicated some staining on before. Yes. And this next photograph, I believe, is a closer shot of that pillow. Yes. And does that also show the, the blood stain or apparent blood stain that you would have noted before? Right here, yes. And again, do we see that uh, pooling of apparent blood purge in this photo as well? You do, in the corner over here. So that pillow was positioned with the apparent blood on the upper right hand corner away from the other blood that you observed on the bed. Yes. And again, the blood staining on the pillow is right here. Yes. So the last two photos, States Exhibit 78, uh, do they depict the chest of drawers that were by the foot of the bed in the master bedroom where Ms. Argy's body was found? Yes, they do. So let's first focus on the photograph on the left. Sure. Here do we see additional blood staining on the carpeted floor? Yes, you do. Here. Here. Did you also see and document in this particular photograph an apparent shoe impression? I did. Where is that? Right here, circling it. The next it. photograph is an enlargement. And yes. Is that an enlargement of the apparent shoe impression? Yes. And is that apparent uh, shoe impression heading to or from the bedroom entrance door? It's heading to the entrance door. And again, when Mid Argy was found, was she wearing shoes? No. Now, yesterday, one of the topics that we discussed were items that were found in the house as part of the processing. And one of the items that we talked about was a receipt from Home Depot. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. And do you recall what that receipt was for purchase of? It was for utility knives. Now, were there any corresponding packaging for utility knives seen and documented on the chest of drawers by the bed? Yes. And let's turn to the second of those two photographs from State Exhibit 78 chest of drawers. Here we see some apparent blood pooling and staining on the floor again. Yes. 
Uh, do we also see in this photo a uh, packaging for utility knives? Yes, you do. Right up here. Orange and white packaging. And this last photo, is that going to be an enlargement of the photo that we're looking at now, focusing yes. on that packaging? And again, do we see the packaging right here? And there's what appears to be a, a drawing of a razor blade in there? Yes. A razor blade. The packaging for the utility knife that was found on the chest of drawers, was that open or closed? It was open. And was the utility knife found inside the bedroom where Maureen Argy's body was found or in the nearby bathroom? No. One moment. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any objection? Okay. And you can step down, you can stay or leave as you choose. Thank, Thank you. Thank Ma'am, if you could remain standing and um, raise your right hand so I can swear you in. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to provide this court and jury shall be the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Once you're settled in, if you could state your full name for our court reporter and spell your last name. Jody Marazzi, M-A-R-A-Z-Z-I. And Ms. Marazzi, let me remind you, because you're wearing a mask, your voices are gonna project the same way. So if you could try to keep your voice up so that everybody in the courtroom can hear you. Understood. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Marazzi. Good morning. So Ms. Marazzi, before we get started, in uh, the spring of 2019, was your last name Johnson? It was. Okay, so, um, and but now we'll refer to you as Ms. Marazzi. Thank you. All right, thank you. So um, Ms. Marazzi, are, um, in the spring of 2019, where were you employed? Um, AFC Urgent Care. And um, where specifically, what AFC Urgent Care did you work for? The Stoneham location. Uh, did you also work it with, in the North Andover location? Prior to that, yes. Are you familiar with Sarah Lemery's? Yes, yeah, she was the manager of those locations. I'm sorry, she was the manager at? Of the North Andover and Methuen locations. Oh, okay, thank you. Are you familiar with William R.G.? Yes. Do you see him here in the courtroom today? I do. Can you please identify him and describe an article of clothing for the record? Um, he's wearing the suit over there. Your Honor, would the record please reflect the witness has identified the defendant? It will. Ms. Marazzi, uh, did you, at some point did you work with the defendant? I did. When, about when was the last time that you remember working with him? Probably 2017. Okay. And um, what type of work was the defendant doing at that time? He was a physician's assistant. Uh, do you remember, was he full-time? Was he per diem? Was he part-time? Uh, I'm not sure what his status was. Okay. And in April 2019 now, did the defendant contact you about employment? Yes. How did he contact you? Text message. Had you and the defendant exchanged text messages in the past? No. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Thank you. Ms. Rossi, I'm showing you State's Exhibit 50. If you could just take a look in there. I'm going to direct your attention right here to Tuesday, April 2nd. Um, we'll start right up at the bottom. Do these text messages look familiar to you? Yes. 
And are these the text messages that you exchanged with the defendant on Tuesday, April 2nd? They are. Okay, we're going to talk about those, but I'll leave those with you for reference. Okay, again, so the text messages you have in front of you are from Tuesday, April 2nd. Correct. Okay. When the police um, spoke with you in regard to their investigation, uh, did you provide them copies of these text messages you had with the defendant? I did. Okay, so um, here is a copy of the first text message enlarged on the screen here. Um, and I'm going to read the messages, and then I'll have some questions for you. So again, we're going to start up at the top here. Tuesday, April 2nd at 9.26 a.m. So the first text message reads, Hey, this is Bill R.G. Writing this with my tail between my legs and wondering if you think you could help me with getting a job at your site. If you could, I would be grateful and in your debt. So again, where were you working in April 2019? The Stone on location of AFC. Okay. And what was your specific role at that time? I was the clinic manager. All right. So you respond... And I believe it, it, it might be a little bit hard for the jury to see the green today. Um, would it be okay if we just dim the lights a little bit? Thank you. Okay. Um, so you respond, I will reach out to Dave for Sue. Sure. And then the response, thanks. Um, so when you said, so the first text message in gray, was that text message received by you? Yes. And then these green text messages, were those text messages that you sent? Yes. So when you refer to Dave, who are you referring to? He was the owner of those locations. And do you know Dave's full name? Dave Adams. Okay. Um, and then you got a response to that text message, thanks. Um, and I'm sorry, you just have to verbally say yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, now directing your attention to the next portion, Tuesday, April 2nd at 1.22 p.m. In the green text message, it says, Remind me in a few hours to send you an email. You can send your resume. I'm just slammed right this moment. And again, the green or text message is sent by you. Correct. So the response you got is K T Y. What did you understand T Y to mean? Thank you. All right. Okay. Now going to the next slide, um, next portion of text messages. Um, Tuesday, April second, three forty-six p.m. Uh, you received a text message saying, "Knowing urgent care, you're probably still slammed, but reminder to see in that email." Thanks, ME4PA at Comcast.net, Bill. And that is a text message you received? Correct. Uh, you then wrote KOREO at AFCUrgentCare.com. Uh, and was that an email address that you provided? Yes. And whose email address was that? The medical director. Okay, and then you, um, this is, it looks like another text message that you wrote. Did something happen with Lisa and Tom? This place is run much differently. There's an active medical director and actual policies and procedures. I love it here. And what were you referring to in that text message? Just the difference of the, how the companies were run. Okay. The defendant then responds, good, no, nothing happened, but just not getting enough hours. I like organization and policies with an active med director. And in response to that, you wrote, yeah, I think it would be good. I told the owner, and he said to send her the resume so they will be looking out for it. And that's how you responded to the defendant at that time? Correct. Okay, so now directing your attention to the next slide up at the top. Um, is this Dave's email or wife's? Oh, sorry, duh, I understand now. And were those text messages that you received? Yes. And you responded, the medical director, correct? Correct. Okay, and then the next text message is, there is a meeting in North Andover slash Methuen tonight. 
is this medical director at your side going to be MD over there? Did I read that correctly? Yes. Uh, and then you responded, she is the MD for all sites. By MD, what were you referring to there? Medical director. Okay. Uh, and then the next text message that you received states, TY, I will send it to here in the next 30 minutes. You responded, sounds good. Did I read that accurately? Correct. And then the next text message that you received says, Dr. Corio, correct? And how did you respond there? Dr. Oreo was her name. Okay, and then the next text message reads, Chris is her first name. Okay, and you correct. were referring to the uh, email address, Kay Oreo? Correct. And then this text message here reads, K T Y. And again, T Y, you understood to mean thank you? Correct. And that's a text message that you received from the defendant? Correct. Did you hear from the defendant again following that text exchange? I did not. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any cross examination? Good morning. Um, so when you received the uh, text message from Bill um, and he asked about a potential position, you had no problems um, recommending him to the medical director? Correct. And so you, that's why you gave Bill the information to send his resume? Correct. And that's why you answer questions about his attendance to the meeting at that night. I'm not sure what his attendance to the meeting was, just about the director being there. Okay, but you knew there was a meeting and there was going to be a meeting. I wasn't aware of the meeting. I wasn't involved in the meeting. Okay, so you didn't know that there was a meeting for all employees of the... Um... No, I wasn't aware at that point that we were even merging. Okay. Then how did you know that the medical director would be there? Because she's the director for all of our sites, I was saying. Okay. We have four sites that I was currently working at. That's good. Um, I may have a problem. Sure. <laughs> Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. And may this witness be excused by both sides? Yes, yes Your Honor. Okay. Maybe you can step down, you can stay or leave as you choose. Thank, Thank you. you. And you can just leave that document there. Thank, Thank you. Your Honor, the state calls Matthew Gaudet to the stand. Would you raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to provide this court and jury shall be the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. And um, as you know, uh, if you could get close enough to the microphone and give us your full name, spelling your last name. Matthew, two T's, Gaudet, G-A-U-D-E-T. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Are you familiar with William Archie? Yes. Do you see him here in the courtroom today? I do. Can you please identify him and describe an article of clothing he's wearing for the record? He has a black suit on, sitting on the defendant's chair. Your Honor, would the record please reflect the witness has identified the defendant? It will. Did you know Maureen Archie? I did. 
How did you know her? She was my sister. Did you and Maureen live in the same household growing up? We did. Who else lived with you? My parents. Was she your older or younger sister? Older. Did Maureen have a nickname? Mo. How would you describe your relationship with Maureen? Um, we were we were close growing up. We were only two years apart, so we were very close. Did you remain close into adulthood? Yes. Did you keep in contact with Maureen through the years and into your adulthood? Yes. How did you two keep in contact? Um, phone calls, text messages, emails, in person. How often did you two speak? <sighs> we would text back and forth a couple times every week, every two weeks. Um, a couple times a month we would talk on the phone. We'd try to see each other over holidays, cookouts, birthday parties. I'm showing you um, State's Exhibit 42, which is a phone number chart the jury is familiar with. Does this chart accurately reflect your phone number in the spring of 2019? Yes. And looking at the number for Maureen up here, uh, does that number also look familiar for Maureen in the spring of 2019? Yes. So turning back to a little bit about Maureen. Did Maureen have any children? Yes, she had two children. And what were their names? Ella and Gavin. Did you see Maureen interact with Ella and Gavin? All the time, yes. What did you see with respect to their relationship? Um, she, she was very caring. She was very proud of them. She would always send pictures of them going to sporting events or when they got good grades at school, or she, she was very proud mother and she wanted to share all their accomplishments with us. Was she an attentive mother? Yes. Did she care and provide for her children from what you saw? Yes. From what you saw of Maureen's interactions with her children and discussions that you had with her before she died, did she have any intention of leaving her kids? Absolutely not. What about relinquishing custody of them to the defendant? No. From your life growing up with Maureen and what you saw, did she have any health or medical issues in her adulthood? No. Was Maureen ever hospitalized as an adult for illness or a medical condition other than childbirth? No. Over the years that you grew up with, spoke with, and interacted with Maureen, how would you describe her demeanor? Maureen was very, um, she was very soft-spoken and reserved when you first met her. Um, she had a, a giant smile that could light up the room, and she had a very contagious laughter. Um, she had a inner strength and a, a, a natural ability that she always had growing up through high school. Um, she always excelled at school. She always did great at sports. Um, she just, it, it, it seemed like everything just came naturally to her and she, um, she was, she was just always outgoing and she wanted to help people and support people whenever she could. Based on your many interactions with your sister, did she ever appear suicidal? No. Were you aware of who Maureen's friends were in the spring of 2019? Yes. And can you just mention some of her friends? Megan Santos, Kelly Hobbs, Karen R.G., Cindy Tanuma. And are you currently married? Yes. And who are you married to? Erin Godet. What was Erin's relationship like with Maureen? They were very close. They were, um, they were like sisters. They would often times that they would get together, they would communicate. Um, my wife didn't necessarily need me to be in the conversation to talk with her. Uh, are you aware of Aaron's phone number in spring of 2019? Yes. So I'm showing you a portion of a communications chart, States Exhibit 43, 
Uh, and I would just like to draw your attention here to this highlighted portion. Um, does this accurately reflect Aaron's phone number from the spring of 2019? Yes. With respect to both Maureen and the defendant, did they each have their own vehicle in the spring of 2019? Yes. Are you familiar with those vehicles? Yes. And can you just tell the jury who drove which vehicle primarily? Uh, Maureen drove a Nissan Murano and the defendant drove a pickup truck. I'm not sure what brand. Okay, so now let's turn to the days before Maureen's death. Were you in regular contact with Maureen at that time? Yes. What was the primary topic that you two discussed? We were trying to figure out um, upcoming plans for Easter that year. Okay. Were you also discussing with her plans about moving out of her home and her in a divorce with the defendant? Yes. Were you and your family supportive of her plans to move out and to proceed with the divorce of her husband? Yes. And when you spoke with Maureen about these plans, what was her tone of voice and her demeanor like during these conversations? Maureen wanted to go through with the divorce, but she was worried about how it would impact her children. That was her main primary focus. She didn't want the children to have to go through it and for the children to be affected by it in any way, and that was one of the reasons that was her reason for staying and trying to make it work constantly did she feel satisfied with her decision to move forward though yes mm -hmm. i'm showing you um so we're going to direct your attention right here to april 1st and then i'm going to direct your attention um to an email uh exhibit states exhibit 56 uh, which is dated April 1st, 2019. Are you familiar with this email? Yes. And I'm just going to direct your attention up to the uh, the two section. Is your email address located in here? Yes. And it's macaudetgaudy79 at yahoo.com? Yes. Okay, so we've already read this email with the jury, um, but generally, what was, the, um, what was Maureen speaking about in this email? Maureen was trying to coordinate all of her friends and family coming up to help her move things out of the house and to get the house ready to eventually sell. Uh, and in this specific email, um, was she talking about Saturday, April 6th, Sunday, April 14th, and or Monday, April 15th as dates to do that? Yes, for people to come up and help her. Do you remember responding to that email? Yes. Okay. And um, just generally, when you responded to her email, were you helping her kind of figure out ways and order in which to do things? Yes. So I'm now going to direct your attention to an email dated April 2nd, 2019. And again, this is another email that the jury has seen before. Um, this is States Exhibit 57. Um, and again, is this, this specific email, it has you listed first on the two line, correct? Yes. All right. And does this appear to be kind of an email in response to you suggesting the order that things should be done? Yes. I had suggested to Maureen that if people were going to go up and start painting, maybe people shouldn't be up there moving stuff out or people shouldn't be cleaning, that we should kind of set a timetable for certain things to be done in a certain order. Okay. Do you remember also receiving an email addressed only to you on April 2nd, 2019? Yes. Okay, so I'm showing you States Exhibit 92. Does this appear to be that email that you just you received sent from Maureen? Yes. All right. And, um, I'm going to read this first and then I'll have some questions for you. So it reads, so I have a plan laid out. Helen Karen will be over 413 and 414 to just do painting. I am trying to get dad to come up when you come on 414 so you can work on the little quote fix it end quote stuff together. 
I have no idea what he may or may not do. I can't depend on him completing anything because he changes his mind every second about whether he will help or not. When Maureen was referring to he changes his mind every second, what was her understanding of who she was referring to? The defendant. The email then goes on to say, moving stuff to Cindy's will happen on Saturday. So in relation to April 2nd, was she referring to that upcoming Saturday, April 6th? Yes. It goes on, mom and dad convinced me to get a professional cleaner. The fact that they are paying for it helped me decide. And I am getting a price for someone to clean one side of the house that has surface mold. Is that accurate? Yes. Now I'd like to direct your attention to April 3rd, the day before your sister died. I'm showing you State's Exhibit 58. This is an email that the jury has also seen before, dated April 3rd. And we're actually gonna start down here at the bottom, April 3rd at 8.32 p.m. Maureen Archie at Yahoo wrote, lost my phone, call Billy, 603-845-7815 in 15 minutes if I don't find. And you are one of the people that received this email? Yes. And then at 9.01 p.m., another email sent, I found it, sorry, is that correct? Yes. And who else received this email? Both of my parents. Did you talk to Maureen at all on April 3rd after receiving this email, after this email was sent? No. So I believe you testified to this at the beginning, but in addition to talking to Maureen about her plans and her divorce with the defendant, were you also talking about upcoming plans in regard to Easter? Yes. I'm now showing you State's Exhibit 54. Um, do you recognize this text message? Yes. And do you remember text messaging your sister on Thursday, April 4th? I do. Okay, so let's just start right at the top of this text message, Mo. And who, who are you referring to here when you say Mo? My sister, Maureen. Okay, so here, right here, Thursday, 9.50 a.m. And you recall this being April 4th, correct? Yes. This is at 9.50 a.m., the text message reads, considering mom and dad will be home now, I'm gonna tell Kathy I'm gonna plan on do, going to Sue Chang's with them. I'll probably call next month or twos so I can text you this weekend and see what you're thinking. And it says, delivered. So was this a text message that you sent to Maureen or received? Sent. And generally, what were you talking about in this text message? Maureen was trying to decide whether or not to come down for Easter. Um, she said she wasn't sure what the defendant was going to do and if he had asked her to stay home and do a family Easter. She she would maybe consider that she was worried about not being with her children on Easter if she came down. So we were discussing whether or not she would be down. Okay. And below that is a text message, 9.52 a.m. Thursday, April 4th, that says, okay. Is that a text message that you received from Maureen's cell phone? Yes. So that was a text message that was sent to you from Maureen's cell phone? Yes. Now looking at State's Exhibit 43, the communications chart, does this chart accurately reflect the 9.50 a.m. text message that Maureen received from you? Yes. And does it accurately reflect at 9.52 a.m. on April 4th the text message that was sent from Maureen's phone to you? Yes. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Any cross-examination? <clears throat> Pardon me, any cross-examination? Yes.
Maureen reached out to you in the spring of 2019 and let you know she was considering leaving her marriage? Yes. Was that a surprise to you that she was considering leaving her marriage? No. She had spoken with you about her marriage in the past? Yes. She had been confiding in you about her marriage for several years? Not all aspects, but yes. Not Certain all parts of it, yes. Okay. But things have been rocky for her at home? Yes. For three or four years? Yes. She would tell you that things were not going well in the marriage, but yes. then she would tell you that Bill was getting help? Yes. They, um, they, they were supposed to be seeing a marriage counselor. He was supposed to be going to meetings for gambling, and he would start it, and then he would stop, and then he would go, and then he would stop. Okay. So during those years, Maureen would sometimes consider leaving and then decide to stay? Yes. <clears throat> when she finally decided to leave for good in the spring of 2019, um, was that a relief to you that she was leaving? Yes, I had been encouraging her to do it. You'd been encouraging her to leave? And in the spring of 2019, you checked in with her regularly about her plans to leave? Yes. You wanted to make sure that she was on top of things? Yes. That she wasn't going to change her mind? Correct. Okay. Did you ever help Maureen um, pay for an attorney? I did. When was that? I honestly i am not sure. Was that in the spring of 2019, or was it in a previous year? I believe it was the previous year. In the years that Maureen and Bill were married, you never saw Bill behaving violently towards her physically? No. Maureen never told you that she felt unsafe at home? Later on, Maureen said that she thought he was looking at her cell phone and looking at her text messages and reading her, you know, reading her emails and stuff. But Maureen never complained that there was physical violence in the home? No. Did you speak with other members of your family about Maureen and Bill's marriage? Yes. Did you speak with members of Bill's family about Maureen and Bill's marriage? No. Fair to say, though, that you and Maureen's family were supportive of her decision to leave? Absolutely. You all wanted her to leave, Bill? Yes. I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Any we direct? No, Your Honor. Okay. May this witness be excused by both sides? Yes, you may. Yes. Okay. Sir, you can step down. Thank you. Stay call Cindy from the moment.
If you could raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Okay. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to provide this court and jury shall be the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I'm sorry? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. And once you're connected close enough to that microphone and settled in, if you could state your full name for our court reporter and spell your name for. Uh, Cindy Tanuma, T-A-N-U-M-A. And will you spell your first name as well? Uh, C-I-N-D-E-E. -E. Thank you. And Ms. Tanuma, I'll just remind you that because we're wearing masks, it's harder to hear. And so if you could project your voice much louder than you'd normally. Okay, thank you. If you don't mind beginning uh, telling the jurors where you work and what do you do? I work at Community Caregivers of Greater Dairy. It's a nonprofit volunteer caregiving group, um, and I'm the executive director. And for about how long have you worked there for? Um, 17 years. And for about how long have you had that position, executive director? Um, 15 years. Back in 2019, you knew Maureen Argy? Yes. How did you know her? We were close friends. For about how long had you known Maureen back in 2019? Um, 15 years, she um, she actually applied for the position that I ended up getting, and when she didn't get it, she still wanted to become involved with the agency, and she was one of the first volunteers that I trained. How would you characterize the nature of your friendship with Maureen over the years? Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful, um, very mutually satisfying. We had kids very similar ages. And um, and I think we both got you know an equal amount out of you know out of our relationship. Did you keep re in regular contact with Maureen over the many years that she was your friend? Yes. And how would you maintain contact with Maureen over the years? Um, she would drop into my office to talk she, um, after she got the kids off to school. Um, my office was right near the interstate where she got on. So oftentimes she would just stop in. We would talk on the phone um, on our both our ways to work because we both commuted to work at the same time. We occasionally text, but not to like, really just to set something up, not to like go back and forth. We mostly talked on the phone or in person. And was that the type of friendship you had where she could just stop by whenever just to, to talk to a friend? Yes, and I made sure she knew that. Yep, I had a you know I had my own private office, and she would come and shut the door, and you know we could you know connect. Talk about anything and anything. Yes. What kind of activities would you do with Maureen over the years? Oh gosh, um, family birthday parties, meet at playgrounds, meet at McDonald's. Both our kids got up really early. And we wanted to do something with the kids before their morning nap because we were both religious about like maintaining naps. And so we would often meet at um, McDonald's on Brown Avenue at like 7 a.m. just to let the kids get some energy out. And and then we go to a playground. We we've been to state parks together, museums, um, fairs, anything that you take young young children to. Parks, swimming. And you talked about Maureen would just show up and you'd shut the door and you'd talk about pretty much everything and anything with her. Yes. Did you have the type of friendship with her in which you shared with each other the turmoils in your lives as well as the triumphs in your lives? Yes. Whether that be personal or professional turmoils and triumphs? Yes. And did you do that over the years with her? Yes. From your interactions with Maureen, and from what you saw, did she have any long-term medical or health issues? Not that I'm aware of. Was she ever hospitalized for an illness or medical condition during your friendship with her outside of that related to her pregnancies of her two kids? Not that I'm aware of. Over the many years that you knew Maureen, that you spoke with her, that you interacted with her in various settings, how would you describe her general demeanor for us? Calm, even, funny, um, sensitive, intuitive. I don't know. She was, she was pretty, um, 
she lowered my blood pressure. She was kind of good at, you know, grounding people. So she was kind of very good at staying, you know, constant. Other people described her as quiet? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that she was quiet compared to someone else. Yeah, to, compared to other people. Um, but it was like a, a different kind of quiet. And was it you who was told me uh, monotonous mo? Is that what it was? Hmm? Um, well, I always knew her as Maureen. I actually only kind of knew after her, her death that so many people called her, called her Mo. I, I really just called her Maureen. So my apologies. I was it's okay. Someone else. Uh, based on your many interactions with Maureen, mm -hmm. your many conversations with her, at any point in the many years that you knew her, did you have any concerns that she may try to harm herself? No. And why do you say that? Because she was basically a single mother. I mean, she was holding down the fort, so she was kind of keeping it all together. So I don't think that that was a choice that, no, definitely not. Even though you characterize her basically as a single mother, you knew at the time that she was married? Right? Yes. And to whom was she married to? Uh, Billy. talked about how she, uh, in your words, a single mother. Did you spend time with Maureen and her kids? A lot of time. My husband and I and our two kids and, and her and her two kids. Yes. And, and how so? What kind of things would you do with Maureen and her kids? They'd come over. We'd go over there. We'd meet places. You know, we, you know, things that, you know, everyone does with, you know, young children. Pu public free events. Most everything we did was free. Um, Yeah, I would say once every, I don't know, month to six weeks, we would see each other, but we would talk, you know, we would talk most weeks on the way to work. And what yep. do you see generally with respect to Maureen and her kids and, and their interaction? Um, her with her kids? Yes. She was very um, loving, supportive, um, calm. Um, she was, she was a, she was a great, she was a great mother, keeping everything on track, food on the table, kids to activities, keeping everything, just keeping everything straight. Now, one of the ways that you talked that you would uh, speak with Maureen or communicate with her was by cell phones? Yeah. And when you spoke with Maureen by cell phone, some people are talkers, some people are texters. How about you and your friend Maureen? We talked mostly on the phone, but we did text towards the end because we were, you know, just trying to coordinate a lot of, there were a lot of balls in the air. So I want to turn your attention. Can you see that? Um, okay. My glasses are in my purse. That's, that's fine. I'll, so, read, I'll read it for you. Don't worry about okay. it. Okay. So what we're looking at is something the jurors have seen many times before. For the record, it's State Exhibit 43. It's a cell phone communications chart, and this is for a cell phone number associated with your friend Maureen's cell phone. And it shows a text message on March 29th sent to a telephone number 603-548-7059. This number ending 7059 back in April of 2019. Was that your cell phone number? Yep, that is. And although uh, this shows, and again, you can't see it, but the jurors can, it says SMS, MSF, S and S, and the jurors are familiar, that's a text message, but you'd also speak with Maureen uh, over the phone by call as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Now, in the weeks before Maureen's death, did she talk to you about her job plans? Yes, she did. And if you can share that with us. Sure. Because it's, it's, you know, obviously it's a great memory, but, you know, she'd kind of put in the work, you know, you know, working in the housing buildings and she really loved her job, but it didn't make that much money. And um, although she did, you know, like kind of that middle management, you know, kind of style, it was more her style. She, someone retired and she was very excited that they had asked her to interview. So she had had her first interview for a supervisor position, which is so kind of not, 
it was out of her comfort zone. So she was asking for some coaching because she knew I was a supervisor and was asking me for advice. And then she just, like she just got this bright smile on her face and you know, things have been really tough. And so she just got a really big smile and she said like, it's gonna, I'm gonna make so much more, you know, I'm gonna make maybe 10, $15,000 more money. And she's like, I think, you know, I, th I think we can do it. This will make it so I can, you know, I can, you know, be there on my own and, and do it. And this is, this is what I need, but it's so scary. And um, I don't think she got, I don't, I'm not aware, but I don't think she got the second interview. Um, but I know she would have gotten it. But um, yeah, she was really looking forward to um, a potential new position at the place that she had been for so many years. She was, and she just, she said, Cindy, I can't wait to, well, I'm, I'm she's, we, we yeah, can't no. Go over, yeah? We, we can't go into what she said. Sure. But from how you're describing this yeah. in, in your own demeanor, she seemed excited. She was excited. Yeah. It also sounds like you're excited for your friend. <laughs> I was. I was. So also in the weeks before her death, did she talk to you about her intents and plans with respect to the marriage that she had? Yes. And what did she indicate to you with respect to her plans and intentions? Um, it was... It was more about the house and, and um, the physical se like separation than like th like the marriage is an you know an entity. So it was more just saying you know that she you know that she um, you know Billy agree you know she wanted to take this opportunity that B Billy was being agreeable to put the house on the market and you know settle some debt and then that she would have you know not the reason but that that would be the propellant for her to be able to physically physically separate from him and and move in with Brenda so it we didn't so much talk about like um like legal matters or or whatever but like this was this was the opportunity she had been waiting for to um to to f have, create some distance between between them. And in terms of what she intended, her plans in doing that and moving forward and moving on, what do you recall her telling you about that? How was she going to achieve that? Where was she going to stay? What was she? Oh, sure. Um, so, you know, she had the the la the second to last time I had seen her. She had said, you know, can I take you up on that offer to, you know, move some possessions into the into the house so we can declutter and start to stage the home? And I said, of course, we just moved in. We have, you know, a thousand square foot basement. It's yours. Do what you want. You know, it's yours, you know, for as long as you want. And so she was going to move um, into um, Brenda, her mother-in-law's home with Karen and her daughter and her and her two kids and whether Brenda stayed there or, or, you know, stayed in Maine, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how that was going to go, but, um, but she was, um, very appreciative of, um, how welcoming and accommodating that Brenda was being, and it was making her feel kind of safe and, um, more sure that she could do it. And you were also helping Maureen in these plans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and how, so you talked about storage and yep. basement? Yep, storage, and then um, she was doing um, a couple. Um, the weekend after her death was, you know, obviously going to be when we were going to be uh, fixing up, kind of all hands on deck, fixing the home up um, as much as we could for staging and for being put on the market. So um, after like the kind of purge, we were going to focus on the house. And when you say we and all hands on deck, it sounds like it was just more than you and Maureen oh, yeah. helping her in these plans. Oh, yeah. And uh, who are some of the other people who are helping your friend Maureen in this transition period? Um, Maddie and Aaron, her parents, um, Karen, Kelly, Brenda. I think, I think that's it. And from what you saw and heard, were Maureen's other friends and family members uh, supportive of her plans moving on and away from the defendant? 
very supportive. And were you and her other friends and family members helping her as she transitioned away from her marriage and physically from the defendant? Yes. So I want to now go to a calendar. This is a calendar that the jurors have seen several times. This okay. is State's Exhibit 91 for identification. And I want to focus your attention on the weekend before her death, which is March 30th and 31st. Mm -hmm. And did you see your friend Maureen that weekend? I did. And uh, when you saw her that weekend, what was she doing? <laughs> she was sh just sh making trips to my house with um, Billy's pickup to, um, to, it was, yeah, to move stuff into our basement. So she made two big, two big purges, you know, and I could tell she was doing it quick, you know, not quickly, but like she just basically just threw whatever in there. Nothing was organized or in boxes. It was just really, you know, the thing is you're trying to sell your house and you want to not have photos be taken of all the stuff. So it was really just like, um, you know, toys and furniture that's not really needed and um, like clutter. That weekend before your friend's death, as she was moving belongings into your basement for storage, was she continuing to talk to you about her plans and intentions moving forward and away from the defendant? Yes. And we talked about what she what she talked about in terms of her intentions and plans, and that was the same that weekend? Yes. Did Maureen and you discuss plans about the following weekend and what she would be doing that following weekend? Yes. And what do you recall about uh, Maureen talking about the following weekend, which would be this weekend of the 6th and the 7th? Yep. I think it was trying to figure out who was available when for that weekend and the following weekend to do painting, um, fix like a to-do list, um, get more stuff. I think there was going to be a additional trips to my house the following weekend, too. So, and I don't know when she was going to be able to like rest her head somewhere else, but I do think that it was probably going to be, you know, close to that weekend was going to be the, you know, the first night, you know, away from the home. Was also among the topics that your friend Maureen talked to you in the days before her death, making sure that the defendant did not have access to firearms. And that's just a yes. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's just a yes or no. Um, yes. So the following, uh, getting back to the calendar, so Maureen was moving belongings into your house that weekend of the 30th and yep. the 31st and also talking to you about plans and intentions and other matters, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, that following Monday and Tuesday, which would be April 1st and April 2nd, do you remember receiving uh, group emails from Maureen expressing her plans and intentions? Yes. The jurors have already seen these emails before, so we're not going to go through them in great detail. Okay. So, and uh, I know you can't see them. Maybe if I uh, read the first sentence, that uh, will refresh your recollection. Okay? Yes? Yes. So the first one is States Exhibit 56. This is from April 1st. It says, Hi, I am sort of overwhelmed with everything, but I'm trying to get a plan together. Do you remember receiving an email from Maureen addressed to you and yes. several other people? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And then we have uh, State's Exhibit 57, which again the jurors have seen before. This is dated April 2nd. And this one starts out, maybe I need guidance, but my situation is different. I wanted painting and taking any stuff to Cindy's first. Do you recall an email along those lines? Yes. And from what you recall generally from those two emails, was uh, what Maureen was saying in those emails consistent with discussions that she was having with you regarding her plans moving forward? Yes. Now we talked about when you last saw your friend Maureen that weekend before her death. Mm -hmm. And we also briefly went over a couple of text messages, or, I'm sorry, emails that mm -hmm. she sent to you and some other people. Sticking with uh, April 2nd, uh, the same day that this second group email was sent, did Maureen also send you two text messages that day? Yeah. 
And did you save those text messages and provided them to the investigators? I did. Now, that's State's Exhibit 53, and I know you can't see those, and I actually have them in a book as well, so bear with me. messages that you received from your friend on April 2nd? Yes. And again, these text messages were taken from your cell phone uh, by investigators with your permission. Right? Yes. So we have three photos here, but there are actually two text messages, right? Yes, because my phone is old. The text was long, so it had to go on to a third screen. Yes. So I'm going to start with the text message that takes up two screens. And these were sent at uh, 10.26 a.m. So what I'll do is I will read that and then I'll have a couple of follow-up questions, okay? From Maureen Argy, do you guys have any time Saturday to let me do some drop-offs with help? You don't have to lift a finger. I think plan is get everything out that needs to go to your house Saturday. And the following weekend, Kelly and Karen will paint. And my brother slash dad will fix stuff. Tuesday, April 2nd, 1026 AM. And that's a text message that you received from your friend Maureen, right? Yep. From your conversations and interactions with her, the reference to drop-offs, what is, what is that a reference to? Belongings. And that's drop-offs to your house, mm -hmm. additional drop-offs? Yeah. And the same with the plan to get everything out that needs to go to your house. That, again, is a reference to stores that you're helping her with? Yes. And so the additional moving out was planned for that following Saturday, April 6th, according to the text message, right? Yes. So let's go to the second text message that you received from Maureen. And this was sent at 12.01 p.m. on Tuesday, April 2nd. That's fine because we have baseball field cleanup in the morning. I will give you a ballpark time and then can be more specific on Saturday. Do you know what Maureen's discussion of baseball field cleanup in the morning was a reference to? I don't think she was coaching. I think, well, he was very, um, Gavin was very into, um, baseball so they probably it, the same as in Gosstown like you know beginning of the season after all the snow melts like all hands on deck you know if you're going to join the team you know the league that season you should go and you know you should go and do your part and pick up sticks and rake and get out all the equipment so I will give you a ballpark time and then can be more specific on Saturday what is Maureen talking about in that portion of the text message to come over and bring the rest of her, you know, the rest of the belongings. I think I had probably said to her, you know, I can't do it till after 10 or something like that. And, and she said, well, that's fine because we have something going on in the morning anyways. And this was Saturday, April 6th? Yes. Four days from this text message sent to you by your friend on April 2nd? Yes. And that's the last time you ever heard from your friend? It is. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any cross-examination? Good morning. Good morning. Maureen for 15 years or so? Yes, you know? about, yep. And the two of you are quite close, it sounds like. Yes. Um, 
over the years, Maureen confided in you about her marriage to Bill? Yes. Um, and Maureen's marriage was unhappy for three, four years before she died? It was after Gavin was born, so what was he maybe? Yeah, I would say, yeah, about that time. Okay. And she would talk to you about her unhappiness in her marriage? Yes. She would talk to you about the problems at home? Yes. Um, and during that time, she would seriously contemplate divorce. Is that right? Um, contemplate, yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. <clears throat> Maureen would contemplate divorce, but she would wind up staying with Bill. Yes, I don't think she'd found a good fit with any of the free consultations she had had. I think she was frustrated by the, the process, by the, you know, the amount of money needed. Um, I don't think she'd found like the right supportive individual to help her through the process. And I really think that she, you know, was trying to um, keep the, you know, she really did want to keep the, I think she was conflicted because she did want to keep the family unit together um, for, for the children. Okay. So Maureen did consult with attorneys over the years? Um, yeah, I don't think it, yes, I can't tell you for how, like, for how long. I think there were, yeah, I can't, but a couple years. So it sounds like divorce was, um, in the spring of 2019, this is not the first time divorce has been brought up. Oh, no. Now, Maureen was not interested in a contentious legal battle, right? Maureen's a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't like conflict. I think she was trying to figure out. Um, she didn't want to exacerbate anything. She wanted. She didn't want um, to anger um, him any more than she needed to. She was just trying to um, make the wisest decisions for. Um, the situation that she was in. Okay. Now you testified that when she decided in the spring of 2019 to leave Bill, that you were supportive of that decision. Yes. You had wanted her to leave Bill before the spring of 2019, is that correct? I really listened more than anything. Um, that's what she needed from me and she was getting strong opinions from almost everyone else, I think, in her life. I needed her to know that she could just talk. So to be honest, I didn't often, and I regret this, but I didn't often um, share my personal opinion because I could see that um, it wasn't required. It wasn't required because you thought others in her life were encouraging her to leave? And anything I could say is something that she already knew, and I think it was mortifying for her to talk about. So I didn't want to, um, I just wanted to listen. Okay. Typically. You yeah. thought Maureen was embarrassed or mortified, you said, to discuss her marital problems? She was a private person. She she never she would always start every, you know, conversation or, or drop in. She'd say, "I don't want to burden you, or I don't want to make this your problem, or I don't, um, I don't want to always come to you and you know talk about this." And I'd always say, "I love our visits. I'm glad I can be of help." So um, she would always have like that text message. She would say, "You don't have to lift a finger." That was just like her because she felt bad enough. Um, so. Maureen 
Maureen never discussed her um, mental health with you, is that correct? No. I mean, they went, I know that they were trying counsel, They were trying counseling. They were in marital counseling. Yep. Right? And Maureen never discussed a depression diagnosis with you. No. She never talked to you about treatment options for depression. No. Um, so we saw a couple of emails that Maureen sent to you and a number of others. Sure. Yes. Um, that included Bill's mother, Brenda. Yes. And Bill's twin sisters. Yep. Um, it included Maureen's parents and her brother and her brother's wife, Erin. Yes. <clears throat> this was um, a sort of list serve, is that right, of folks who were going to help Maureen through the process? Yes. I think you called it Team Maureen. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so fair to say Maureen had um, people on her side supporting her through this divorce process? Through the move? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. And you were in communication with some of those other people as well, with Kelly and um, Karen, or um, Brenda about the, the moving plans? No. Okay. No. Okay. I, I've become closer to them after she okay. was deceased. I really just saw them at um, birthday parties. Okay. So after Maureen's death, you have grown closer, you said, to um, yeah. some of Bill's family members? Yeah. Um, after Maureen's death, you also spent some time with the RG's neighbors, the Langs, is that correct? Yes. You spent about two hours uh, at their house? Yes. Um, and at that meeting, you all talked about Maureen? Yes. And you talked about Bill? Yeah. And you met with the Langs um, before or after you spoke with the police? Before. Okay. It was when I had drove to the house. I was dropping off boxes um, for the move, and I had seen the commotion and didn't know what had happened, and I went next door. Over the years, it sounds as though you were closer with Maureen than you were with Bill. Yeah. But you did see Bill and Maureen together? Yeah. Throughout the years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the at birthday parties, but never on never on out never on outings. Just w if we were to go to Chuck E. Cheese or to to their home. Okay. Yes. And when you saw Bill and Maureen interact you never saw physical violence between the two of them? No. Uh, you never saw Bill threaten physical violence? No. Maureen never uh, told you that things were violent at home? Um, violent, no. It had been, um, he had been increasingly um, hostile, um, um, uh, intimidating. Um, uh, she used the word bullying, which she knew had bothered him. Okay. Now, Maureen uh, talked to you about her plans to tell Billy she was leaving him. Yes. And she talked with you after she told Bill that she was, in fact, leaving him. Can you restate that? Um, so Bill, or, um, Maureen talked to you about the conversation she had with Bill when she told him she was leaving. Is that correct? Well, I mean, she, you know, she told me that they were, you know, agreeing that the house needed to be sold. She was going to stay at Brenda's, mm -hmm. wasn't sure where he was going to be staying. Um... I, 
I know that they were going to tell, my understanding was that they were going to tell the kids um, sometime like midweek, so maybe the day after I talked. They were going to, she was going to, they were going to like sit them down and tell them at some point that we week. Talk with them together. Yes. Um, when did Maureen find out that she was able to move to Brenda's home, that Brenda's home was going to be made available to her? Oh, I, I mean, Brenda had been offering it for qu quite some time, the summer before maybe even. Um, I think it was, you know, people offer things and you have to be in the right place to, you want, to want to accept it. So I think it had been offered to her previously, but I can't tell you like when they had had a talk about like, um, I think probably the, you know, the, maybe the month before or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Did you get along well with Bill when Maureen and Bill were married? I did not get a. I didn't. I did not get along with him. I mean, he's very charismatic. Okay. Um, life of the party. Like he's, he's, he's likable when he's there. You know, when he's there. You know, joke. You know, joking and. Um, I can't, I don't have any, I don't have any bad memories of, of engaging with him. Okay. No, I mean, he even, you know, he's even helped with, with moves and, mm -hmm. and, you know, loaning us his truck. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any, so the reason between why, me and him, no, I don't have anything bad between me and him. The reason no. why you and Maureen often spent time together without Bill was not because you disliked Bill. No, not no, he was always him. welcome, no. She just always said he was working. So, yep. If I could have one moment. I think those are all the questions I have for you. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing further, Judge. Okay. And may this witness be excused by both sides? Yes. Okay. Um, you can step down and you can stay or leave as you choose. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, why don't we take our morning recess? As soon as you're ready, we'll come on back. Anybody else said? Do you uh, need? Judge, I do want to discuss, or we want to discuss uh, scheduling. So we have sure. three more witnesses for today. Uh, that will not take us through late afternoon. We may finish up very quickly after lunch. Okay. We don't have any other witnesses scheduled for today. The only witnesses we have remaining are the two uh, expert witnesses who are being flown in. They will be testifying first thing tomorrow morning. Okay. So. Okay. Um, thank you for sharing the scheduling and just keep that in mind from the defense side and um, whatever whatever we need for time we have it so um, and I know I as I said earlier I provided the jury instructions in a print form if there's anything um, and other than the, the instruction I told you I forgot to include if you want that in um, I'll provide you a new draft copies just so you can see how it's set up and um, but if you don't mind taking a minute to review the document again in case there's something more that you'd like me to include. Thank you. Your Honor, I just, just for uh, planning purposes, if, to, if we finish like at noon tomorrow or at 2 o'clock tomorrow, do we do closing on Monday? 
it, it, if we if we ended up at noon, I'd probably want to do closing an argument on Friday. Yeah. All right. But you know, we'll play it by ear. It, I'm not going to. Um, I and I certainly will get input from council. I don't. I will. I'm not going to be unreasonable in any way about it. But okay. if there's plenty of time and everybody's ready, then we'll move forward. All right. Thank you. So planning purposes, and I'll rely on the court and defense counsel's discretion. Uh, I was going to seek an extension beyond the one hour summation time. I anticipate I'll probably be an hour and a half. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. And that will play into my decision as well. So um, if um, as we continue on, uh, the defense um, wishes to share their anticipated length. That will that will help me make a decision. Okay. Thank you. Okay.